morning good morning children our internet language thumbs up thumbs up for good morning and a big smile and a big big smile are you all excited yes ma'am yes ma'am even i am excited very good okay i think we should start come on because it's 4 minutes more i mean about that yes ma'am we'll wait for him we all we are like the room is full it's 98 no more entry would be there i hope the author is there yes i can see her and uh, ahana is also there yeah okay all right so let's begin all the best awesome. yeah good morning everyone good Welcome morning ma'am good morning ma'am good morning ma'am mute that is the good morning ma'am Darling, you will keep yourself on mute so that we can listen to each other. And good morning is thumbs up always, right? Good yes, children. Yes, ma'am. Very good children. Good. I'm Kumudha Neja. I'm from Salwan Public School. I extend a very, very warm welcome to our special guest, Miss Sara Brennan, a renowned author, Miss Rashmi Malik. principal salwan public school gurugram miss ahana sabarwal ambassador girl scouts teachers from sister salwan schools and our young and lovely readers without wasting any time because i'm i know you're very very excited to speak to the author i will introduce miss ahana sabarwal she is the ambassador girl scout who had been associated with salwan group of schools for her initiative in organizing wonderful reading sessions for our children thank you so much for ahana for this session as well now we request ahana to please carry forward the session and begin by introducing miss sara hi everyone thank you for joining this meeting uh, my name is ahana sabarwal and i've been in girl scouts for 9 years now and i'm now an ambassador i'm currently in my last year of school so i'm in 12th grade and some of you may recognize me because i visited the school um branches multiple times for book clubs um right now you will be talking with a famous writer named sarah brennan who is known for writing multiple books about chinese chinese zodiac animals like tale of run rat run and the tale of pinyin panda um i've had the pleasure of meeting meeting and hearing sarah brennan back when i was in 5th grade and i hope that I want I want to share the same experience with you. Uh through these books I hope that you find a love for reading and I hope that you learn more about Chinese culture. Sarah Brennan. Thank you very much Ahana for that beautiful introduction. Um I do know Ahana I know her lovely mum Priya Sivoel who I believe is with us on the corner. Hi Priya. and i just wanted to thank you very much for your, you uh to you for introducing me to such a wonderful school um hello everybody there at sawan public school i very much wanted also to thank um rashmi malik the principal of the school and also kumad and dilbag for for making this session possible with you all now what i wanted to do today was first of all to talk to you a little bit about why reading is so important now i know that you be you belong to the uh sisterhood of readers which is such a fabulous title and i know a lot of you belong to that club and it's a great club because actually reading is probably the most important thing you can do with your spare time and um we know we always read for work and we read for school but you need to read an awful lot and i want to tell you a little bit uh, about why that is so so i'm going to share a, a presentation with you first of all i'm going to tell you a little bit about how it was i became an author which i think you'll find fun to see and then afterwards a little bit about why reading is so terribly important to you to have a happy healthy and wealthy life and then as a treat i'm going to be reading you the tale of run run rat and you'll be able to see the beautiful images then so let me just share a screen with you if wait just a moment please i'm 
next screen should be coming up. Now, can you just confirm that you can see that screen, please? Maybe with a show of thumbs. If you can put your thumb up, uh, excellent. And you can see the screen says, how did I become an author? Right, wow. This is me when I was a little girl. You can see when I was a baby. And you can see when I was about nine years old and I was at school. And that photo was taken because I'd written my first chapter book. And it was all about a, a cat and a girl called Penny. And it was called Penny and her cat. And the cat's name was Eric, which is a very strange name for a cat. And I can only put that down to the fact that my grandfather was called Eric. So that's me standing in class posing then. Now, I fell deeply in love with this very old man. I wonder if any of you know who that old man is. You see the hearts coming up? That's because I was madly in love. He was, of course. Do you recognize any of these images? You may have read his books. I wonder if you know it's... <laughs> Here he goes. I'm sorry, I'll go back there. It's Dr. Seuss. And you may have in your school library books by Dr. Seuss, which are very funny. They're written in rhyme and they're, they're wonderful and they use beautiful language. But this is how I fell in love with reading. And it also made me want to become a writer. So I started writing poems. I actually wrote a poem about being a scout because even though I was a girl and I wasn't allowed to be in the scouts, I wanted to be a boy scout. I wrote a poem about a turtle and how basically if you tickle a turtle, you can eat it for dinner. I always loved nature and animals and you can see there in the top left corner you can see the house I lived in which was in Tasmania. Tasmania is the island state at the bottom of Australia and we had beautiful garden and we had a lot of animals as you can see even peacocks which I know you're very familiar with and a lot of the other pastimes before the world went digital for example I used to collect things I actually collected butterflies. My sister, older sister, collected shells. My brother collected stamps. Making things all the time. I hope this is what you do at home in your spare time. Building models of things. Now all this is really, really important to becoming a great writer. Interestingly enough, playing a lot. I hope you kids spend a lot of your spare time simply playing. Playing inside. Dressing up. This is what I did as a kid a lot. And lots of time to daydream. Now, you might think that I was just having fun and wasting time, but no, I wasn't. What this does is it develops a creative brain and it's really important to have a lot of imagination. This was the thing I did most of though. Why don't you put your thumbs up if you love reading books? Who loves reading books? Do you love reading books? <laughs> Me too. Now this is the most important tool to become a great writer as well as a great reader. <laughs> that is why I first of all became a lawyer. But I really wanted to be a writer. Now my life took me in lots of different paths. At times I was a waitress. Then I ran out of money. So I worked in a tax office in Brisbane, in Queensland in Australia. And then I went to London. And you can see all the different jobs I did there. I worked on a switchboard. I worked as a receptionist. I worked in a factory on the factory floor. And I also worked in an art gallery. Now all these experiences add up. This is why I encourage all of you when you leave school, have a rich life and do all sorts of different jobs. And it doesn't matter how menial or, you know, you might think it's very menial to work in a factory, but this gives you experience of life and experience of people and it gives you imagination. I ran out of money again. Uh-oh. And that's why I became a lawyer again. And then I went to Hong Kong. Here's Hong Kong. 
and I love Hong Kong. Hong Kong basically is a place where dreams can come true. And I started writing again. I wrote for a parenting magazine. And then my very first children's story called A Dirty Story was published. After that, we published an even dirtier story. But then because I was working with a publisher and we had a few issues, I was tearing my hair out. I thought I shall not be daunted. So I set up my own publishing company, Auspicious Times. And I signed up with my wonderful artist. Now I know you've seen some of my books and don't you think the illustrations are fabulous and funny? Well, Harry looks just like the Harry in this picture. I signed up a graphic designer because as a writer, you have your illustrations, but you need a graphic designer to put the book together. We created a dummy book, which is like a pretend book. And that was the tale of Chester Choi. And then my second book, which you're going to hear today, the tale of Run Run Rat. And which for six weeks in Hong Kong outsold Harry Potter and Stephanie Meyer. So I thought, aha, I'm onto something. So then I wrote a book for every single year of the Chinese zodiac and the Chinese calendar tales were born. There you can see my name on the bottom, Sarah Brennan and the artist Harry Harrison. And 12 years later, we've finished the books. We've even got a book about a panda. That's the black book you can see there, which basically explains how the animals got into the zodiac. And that's about a panda. <clears throat> So that's how all my books were born. Now, this is what I've learned. You have to believe in yourself and you have to be brave and be bold. And this is especially for you girls out there. You have to be prepared to say no and walk away. You have to be very tenacious. That means you have to work hard and let nothing discourage you. You have to be inventive and you have to be proactive. That means you don't wait for people to come to you. You go to them and you knock on their door until they open the door. Now, when one door closes, I know that another door will always open. If you're disappointed, work is the very best remedy. You work and you work and you work because the harder you work, the more new opportunities will present themselves. And then last of all, working for yourself is much harder than working for somebody else, but it's also much more rewarding for me anyway. Now, I just want to explain to you why reading books is so important. It's actually because books are a brain's best friend. A lot goes on when you're reading a book in your brain that you don't know, but it happens all the time. First of all, I want to ask you, put your thumbs up. Who wants to be rich and famous? Me! <laughs> okay. Who wants to live a long and healthy life? Me! <laughs> Next one. Who wants to be happy? We all want to be happy, don't we? Now, I can tell you, the recipe for being rich and famous, for living a long and healthy life, and for being happy, is all in reading books. And I'm going to explain to you why. It's very fascinating, and it's based on the science of what goes on in your head when you read books. First of all, we all know that to learn anything, you have to be able to read. But why is it so important to read books, especially in our leisure time, just for fun? Why is that so important? This is why. Just think, when you're reading a book, it's quiet, and you're concentrating for a long time on a still object, a static object. This is how our brain learns focus and concentration and little kids who are put in front of 
computer screens or digital games too young, science shows they cannot develop how to focus and concentrate. We often take focus and concentrating for granted, but in fact, it's a skill that is interesting. It's actually impossible to read without your using your imagination. Do you know, scientists have done experiments with people. They've put electrodes on their heads and then asked them to read a book. And they did this with a bunch of boys. Now, the boys were reading about another boy. And this boy was climbing up a cliff. And he was experiencing fear. And he was experiencing doubt. And he was climbing up the cliff like this. And he finally got up to the top. And he felt overjoyed. And he felt elation. And then he fell off. And he felt terrible fear. What the scientists discovered is that the areas of the brain of all those readers that would light up if they were that boy themselves climbing the cliff was lighting up in their brain. What actually happens when you're reading, they call it sensory simulation. And what that means is that all your senses are copying what's going on in the book. Now, what's doing that? It's your imagination. Your imagination is imagining all the sights and the sounds and also the feelings that's going on in the book. Now, what happens if you exercise a muscle a lot? The muscle gets strong. But if you don't exercise the muscle, it, get weak, it gets weak and fades away. It's exactly the same with exercising the imagination. The imagination is not something you can take for granted. It's something that you develop. Babies are born with the capacity to imagine. But if you stop reading lots and lots of books, then your imagination will get weaker and weaker. So imagine all those pictures being painted in your brain all the time. That's your imagination working over time. Albert Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge. When you think about it, he was right. Because if knowledge was all we need, then all the problems in this world would be solved. But look at the problems we have today. What we need today is we need young people particularly who can think outside the box. And to think outside the box, you don't look at what knowledge we have, you look at your power to imagine something different. This is why it's essential that kids of your age particularly, you are the future of this planet and you guys, we're looking for you to be able to think outside the box and fix a lot of the problems that we adults have created. Now, sadly, the quickest way to kill your imagination is this spending too much time on digital screens. The problem with digital screens, they're a lot of fun, but the problem with, for example, digital games is that your imagination is on a holiday in Hawaii. Just think why. You don't have to imagine anything. The pictures are already there on the screen. The sound is already there. Everything's moving so fast, you don't even have time for things to sink in. But also, what happens in the story? You might say, well, I can influence that game by making this choice or that choice. But all your choices are limited by the software, what's in the software. So it's not your imagination you're exercising, it's the developer, the game developer. So this is why reading books is so much, infinitely more important than spending time on digital games. I always say, spend as much time on digital games as your mum would allow you to eat junk food. Because I'm afraid that spending time on digital screens, a lot of it is junk food for the brain to learn and one of the most important and quickest ways to learn that skill is to read a lot of books now this now look at this did you know that children's books contain double the number of sophisticated words than adult conversation so when you go home you say mom dad do not talk to me i'm going to read a book because i can even in a children's book get more sophisticated words this is fascinating. If you read just 15 minutes a day, in one year you've read over one million words. Wow. 
And this is why it matters. A study was done that actually shows that the more words, the bigger your vocabulary, the higher you will rise in your profession. People with limited vocabulary end up on the shop floor in a factory. The presidents and the vice presidents look at their vocabulary, 87%. So how do you improve your vocabulary? The best and easiest way. The way that will serve you all your life is by reading and reading and reading books. And the higher your vocabulary, the higher you will rise in any profession you choose to undertake. This is so important. We have to look at what sort of society we want to create. And did you know there is a strong correlation in psychological papers that show that people who read a lot of fiction are more empathetic. They're more sympathetic to other people. And it stands to reason, doesn't it? Because guess what happens when you read? You are imagining that you are in the shoes of the person in that story. Now that's called empathy. Empathy is imagining and thinking what it would be like to be that other person in their difficulty. And so studies have shown that historically, societies where people read a lot of books function more empathetically and they are less violent than other societies. So if we want a society that is kind and empathetic, we need to read a lot of books and we need to promote reading a lot of books and it creates more empathetic individuals. People are much more likely to volunteer, to donate, and even just to vote in elections if they read books. Isn't that interesting? Now, massive general knowledge, look at that. Good old Confucius back in China, over 2000 years ago, he said, you cannot open a book without learning something. If you want to be the most knowledgeable kid in your class, if you want to be the kid that goes to university and gets the top scores because of your incredible general knowledge, all you've got to do is read, read lots and lots of books. Original ideas. When you're reading, everything you're reading is going into your brain. And what it's doing is it's cross-connecting with things you might have previously heard of, things you've done before. All this, it creates a vast spider web of knowledge in your brain. So that when it comes time for you to write, you're going to have a very original brain. Now look at this. Great readers become great writers. Stephen King, who's a very popular author, particularly amongst that out, says, if you don't have the time to read, you don't have the time or the tools to write. It's simple as that. You cannot become a great writer if you are not a great reader first. Now, this is what I particularly wanted you to see. Look here. So this is the last slide on this section of my presentation, but I just want to show you that they've done studies in the United States. They've also been replicated in Japan. This is something that can apply anywhere. And that is that they've followed up students who've done a lot of reading while they were at school, the big readers. Now, the kids that were the big readers, they were followed up for decades, for tens and tens of years afterwards. And they discovered that the kids who read lots and lots of books got better grades at school. They stayed longer in school. They got higher qualifications in tertiary education at university. And then they were the ones that got the best jobs, which you can imagine why, because they would do better in interviews, wouldn't they? They've got the language and they've got the knowledge to do well in interviews. Now, they kept their jobs for longer. They got better paid. They had a happier family life. Isn't that fascinating? And they had better health. They had a longer life. They lived longer. And the same for their children and their children after that. Isn't that fascinating? This is the immense value and benefit of reading books. Okay, now I think we just, there you are. Now, Abraham Lincoln, one of the greatest of the American presidents ever. He was born into extreme poverty. He lost his mum when he was nine. He had less than a year in school, and yet 
He was one of the greatest presidents the world has ever seen, and he was one of the greatest speakers. And he wrote the greatest speeches the world has ever seen. And he said the reason why, it was reading books. When his mum died, his dad remarried a very kind woman, and she loved books, and she wanted Abraham to love books. And so she gave him lots and lots and lots of books, and he read them all. And he said that is what created him. Isn't that interesting? So you too, whether you're a boy or whether you're a girl, you can become as great as Abraham Lincoln if you read and read and read. I think it's exciting time now. We're now going to read the tale of Run Run Rat. Are you all ready? Put your thumbs up if you're all ready. Okay, right. I've got to share the screen again. I'm not very good on technology, so pardon me if I get it wrong. I'll sort it out very quickly. Here we are. Now, this is the one I want to share. And I'm going to go. And can you see it? Oops. Get that one down. Now, thumbs up if you can see the picture. Oh, what happened? Okay. Can you see the pictures? Yep. Yay. Okay. <laughs> the tale of Run Run Rat. Now, there's something I've just got to get off here. That's all right. Okay. So here's my book, and you can see the pictures on the screen. This one is the first book in the Chinese calendar tale series. And I wrote this one just before the Olympics in Beijing. So this was back in two or just before 2008 and the Olympics were in 2008 and I thought, aha, I'll write my story about the rat, which is the first animal in the Chinese zodiac, but I'll make sure that my rat goes to the Olympics. So we'll turn the first page. Oh, I dedicated this to all children who try their very best, and especially for my two daughters, Beatrice and Annabelle. And Charlie, the illustrator, and not Charlie, Harry, the illustrator, dedicated it to his children, Charlie and Lucy. We'll start the story. Run Run was a village rat who lived in Western China. His mother was a pastry cook. His father was a miner. He had an older sister and a little baby brother and 47 cousins too who wrestled with each other. And here you can see with my little hand here, you can see mum. There's mum and there's all the yummy egg tarts, which is a real specialty in China. Hang on. And then you can see dad here and the baby little baby and this is the annoying older sister who's always filing her nails and here is Run Run and here's the 47 cousins always wrestling with each other and here also we've got two little characters that are always going to be on every page I call them yin and yang and they are always doing Olympic events but often they are cheating they're very naughty so here they are now we'll turn the page he lived a simple country life beside the river Yangtze, pursuing all the pastimes which might take a young rat's fancy, like taking pigs to market as the eastern sun was dawning, then making clever bargains till the middle of the morning, then fishing by the riverside or digging in the garden or weaving baskets from bamboo before the shoots could harden. Like rounding up the ducks and geese and tending to the oxen, like helping ancient relatives to put their shoes and socks on. A quiet life of happy toil with rustic joys aplenty which would completely satisfy 19 rats out of 20. And yet, a one young village rat in search of fame and glory, the simple life was not enough. And so begins my story. Now you can see on the picture, here is a little rat and he's fishing with his toe. And here are yin and yang, and they're doing, I think, the rowing. 
in the Olympics. But look at this. Yin is whacking Yang over the head with a paddle and he's going, yak, splat, into the river. I don't think that that is within the Olympic guidelines. He comes from France. He's a French rat. Do you all know how to say hello? Can you say bonjour, René? Say bonjour. He goes, oh, bonjour, mes petits amis. He's cute, isn't he? I've got another one to introduce you to. Here is my panda. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and my panda is called Pandora because she lives in a box. <laughs> and I might, do you want to see some more animals while we're waiting? So, all right, here we are. And we're going to share this again. Okay. Can you see the pictures? Hands up, thumbs up. And my little rat's saying, I can see them too. <laughs> okay. Now, Run Run was no average rat, and average rats are clever. The list of things they're good at seems to carry on forever. Yet, everything a rat can do, young Run Run could do finer than any rat you'd care to name the length and breadth of China. A rat can run with style and ease. Run Run was even quicker. A rat can charm the birds from trees, but Run Run was far slicker. A rat is good at algebra, but Run Run was a master. No matter what the answer was, he always got there faster. Can you see this little equation up here? This is actually Harry Harrison, the artist, has been very clever because it's actually an English saying, and this is how it goes. It goes, one bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Have you ever heard of that saying before? A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. What that actually means is that we should be content and happy with what we have, the things we have, rather than always chasing out after things we can't have. It's a recipe for happiness. It's good, isn't it? A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. But most of all, young Run Rat was a creature of ambition. He was from nose, yep, to tip of tail, a rodent with a mission. And so it was one morning that he left his humble station to be the first of all his kind to travel his great nation. And you can see here we have got, uh-oh, we've got yin and yang and they're doing judo. And they're thumping each other. Boom, boom. Next one. It was a lovely day in spring. He set off at a scamper with fond farewells from family and dinner in a hamper. There's his hamper. He had no map or compass, nor a trusty friend beside him. Yet Run Run kept on target with the sun and moon to guide him. Actually, sorry, the sun and stars to guide him. He sailed the mighty Yangtze and the Pearl and Yellow Rivers. He trekked the Himalayas where the famous Yeti shivers. Have you ever heard of a Yeti? Up in the Himalayan mountains, it's a mythical big animal. And people find their huge footsteps, so sometimes they call it Bigfoot. And here it is in the picture. He gazed in awe and wonder at the terracotta army. He cruised the Guaylin River where the breeze blew sweet and balmy. He marveled at the Great Wall, look at this, and the icy Harbin sculptures. That's from North China. There's a place called Harbin where every winter they have an ice festival and they create even buildings out of ice. And here is Chester Troy, my dragon made out of ice. He visited the hill tribes where he learnt about their cultures. And everywhere that Run Run went, he posted home a letter with photographs and little gifts to make his mum feel better. Isn't this a beautiful picture? And here, can you see this? This is the Chinese flag. Harry has cleverly drawn the sunset, but it's actually the Chinese flag, which is the red background, with the golden stars. 
oh no, look at yin and yang. Here they are, they're doing the shot put and table tennis. And yin is trying to go round and round and round with the shot, pent, uh, shot, shot put. And he's going to go boom like this. But when he does, yang is going to bat it back with the table tennis bats. These are very naughty Chinese crickets. One dry and dusty summer's day, young Run Run paused to ponder the many wondrous sights he'd seen from here to there and yonder. He cast his mind on lakes and seas, on forests, fields and mountains, and towns and pretty villages and city squares and fountains. He thought about his family. He thought about his mission. He wondered if the time had come to end his expedition. And yet, for all his happy dreams of cosy home fires burning, he somehow knew it wasn't yet the right time for returning. Now, boys and girls, I'm looking at our time and I want you to have time to ask questions. So what I'm going to do now is I will tell you the story. I'll read you some of the verse, but I'll tell you some of it also, which will make it a little bit quicker because then we'll have time for questions at the end. Is that good? Put your thumbs up if you like that idea. So here is Run Run and he's looking at a map of China and he's saying, where shall I go next? He's been everywhere. So... He decides he wants to go to the heart of the country and he realises, I haven't been to the most important part of China. And you know where that was? It was the capital. It was Beijing. So he's tracing his paws around the map and he's saying, this is where I'm going to go. And you can see he's got his finger on Beijing. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the page. Tell me if you can see the next illustration. If not, I'll share it again. Can you see this one? It's of Beijing. No. Okay. I'm going to do a new share and I'm going to do this one. Can you see that? Aha. Uh -huh. Excellent. Okay. Now this is Harry's picture of Beijing and I think it's very funny because you've got here the man who's on the drill. Have you ever seen a man on a drill and he's going up and down and up and down so fast? You can see his eyes are going up and down his forehead. And then we've got yin and yang down here. Oh, dear. Yin is tickling yang under the arm, and yang is trying to do the weightlifting. This is really unreasonable behavior. Very naughty indeed. Now, Beijing is a place with quite extraordinary features, like 18 million humans, let alone the other creatures, and nine gazillion motor cars, and bicycles, and scooters, and motorbikes and buses with extremely noisy hooters and hammers hammering round the clock and drillers drilling loudly and workers working night and day and buildings rising proudly and people rushing left and right and jostling and scurrying and no one saying how do you do and everybody hurrying so Let's have a little look at the next picture. I shall screen share it again. You share. Here we are. So, this is what happens to Run Run. He's sitting on a rock and he starts missiles and he's thinking of all her kindness, but most of all, he's thinking about her steam buns. And he suddenly realizes he is starving. Run Run was a brave young rat. He didn't like to wallow, but suddenly he felt alone and worse, he felt quite hollow. He heard his tummy growling and he realised he'd grown thinner and then at last it hit him. He was desperate for his dinner. So we'll see where he goes. So he goes into a restaurant and looks what happens. They all go, ah! It's a rat! And they're all pushing him with brooms and sticks and hoses. And no matter where he went for dinner, he was chased out of the restaurant. Poor thing. So finally he runs and he runs and he runs and he ends up right in the middle of Beijing. And I shall show you where. There. He ends up 
in a square right in the middle of Beijing. Now, I wonder if you know what the name of that big square is. It's called Tiananmen Square. And do you know that during the Olympics, that's where the marathon started, the very big 42 kilometer race. And he is run run. And he suddenly smells his mother's cooking and he's going, oh, I can eat my mother's cooking. And he follows the smell and he weaves in and out of the legs. And you can see where the smell is coming from. It's coming from the cameraman. But then suddenly, kaboom, a shot runs out. And Run Run goes, hey, what's happening? Because suddenly the legs are running away. And of course, you and I know that that was the marathon starting. Off go the runners. And Run Run saying, hey, they're taking away my steam bun. And he says, I'm going to get my steam bun. I'm going to have that bun in Beijing. He rushed along the city streets and up and down the byways. He wheeled around the roundabouts. He pelted down the highways. And on and on the runners ran. And on and on he chased them. And faster still they raced away. And faster yet he raced them. Suddenly they reach a mighty door and in go the runners. And he follows them in. And you know where he is? He's in the Bird's Nest Stadium in Beijing. And suddenly, as he comes in, he hears the crowd, and the crowd is going, Run! Run! And he's going, oh, That's my name! Run! Run! screamed the massive crowd, and Run Run smiled with pleasure. At last the people knew his name, at last they had his measure. Run, 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 they yelled again. He sprinted even faster. With all the strength and energy, a famous rat can muster. So he was making a big mistake. He thought they were calling for him. In fact, the crowds were just going, run, run, run to all the competitors. So he's so encouraged by hearing people yelling his name, or he thinks they are, that he passes all the competitors. And finally, he gets to this one last man. Now this man is huge and he's got shoulders like buffaloes. He's like a buffalo. He is so big. And Run Run sees that the smell is coming. Can you see here? There's the cameraman and there is the steam bun in his pocket. Now Run Run is just about to beat the guy coming first. But the guy coming first is swerving in front of him. He's not allowing him. Have a look at this next one. Run Run's going, at last, at last, my lovely bun, he cried in pleasure. But in between, the leader ran as if to guard the treasure. He sized him up. The man was huge with massive back and shoulders and head just like a buffalo and muscles big as boulders. So guess what Run Run does? He takes one massive leap and he leapt over the ox's shoulders. Run, 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 rang louder still. It made him even bolder. He jumped onto the buffalo and leapt over his shoulder. Can you see him here leaping over the shoulder? And there is the finish line. He shot right through the ribbon like a bullet from its socket. And as it tore, he landed on the steam bun in the pocket. My bun, my bun, he cried in joy. He won, he won, came ringing. The rat just won the marathon. The joyous crowd was singing. And Run Run, he looks around him and he can see all the screens above him and it's all saying, Run Run, and you can see his face and the crowd's going, we love him. And Run Run's going, hum. He sat he quietly sat and munched his bun upon the winner's podium. He pondered on how swiftly glory often follows odium. That's when people don't like you. And how a humble rodent from a tiny little village can find great fame and fortune with a little luck and courage. So you know what he did next? Let's have a look. He gathered up his hamper and his luggage and his medals. He bought a shiny motor car with flashy wheels and pedals. 
and back along the motorway as fast as you could fancy, he drove home to his village on the mighty river Yangtze. So I guess he went home to his mum. And there he goes with his first prize round his neck. And look at Yin and Yang. They're sitting in the back going home with him. So that's the end of the story. Now it would be great if we, I think we've got a couple of minutes to have some questions. I'll just stop screen sharing here, I guess. Stop share. Okay, I'm back. Does anyone have any questions? Are you all shy, are you? <laughs> mm, I tell you what, I'm going to ask you some questions if you don't ask me any. Who loves reading books? Hands up. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. Who likes drawing pictures? I tell you what, if you love reading books and drawing pictures, you are well on your way to becoming an author illustrator of a book. Wouldn't that be amazing? Who wants to write books one day? Do any of you want to write a book one day? Ah, oh, Anya, Shivanshi, that's fantastic. How exciting. I can only see a few of your faces, so if I'm leading you out, it's just because I can't see your name. I but that's great. Uh, children, you know, those who want to ask you a question will have to type their name in the chat. Okay? That's fine. That's lovely. If you want to ask a question, type your name in the chat and uh, so we'll unmute you one by one. Okay? Type your name in the chat. Dilbak, just can unmute your name. Okay? Student, you can use the handraiser option also. Anushini, you can uh, ask for a uh, query better. Yes, sir. Uh, Mom, uh, which are the more international bestsellers of your own books? Oh, which is which sells the best? Some, yes, ma'am. Uh, connection Anything? issues there. That's a good question. Okay, the ones that sell the best. Um, my bestseller of all of them is actually the Dragon Book, but one reason why is it's been around the longest. See this one here. The Tale of Chester yes. Choi, because this was the very first one I did. But also, people seem to love dragons. Do you like dragons? I love yes, dragons. Ma but people seem to love dragons. And it's really interesting because, you see, when I go up into China, because I visit Chinese schools a lot, the one that sells the most, and you're going to find this interesting, it's Run Run. And that's because in China... People don't feel the same way about rats. They think rats are very brave and courageous as so they like rats. In England, it's different. Guess which one is the favourite one in England? Temujin, which I know that some of you have read. And I think that's because British people, they think of India and they think of tigers in India. So that's a bestseller in England. So it depends on where you are. There's a little island in Hong Kong called Lama Island, and there's lots of buffaloes and wild cows on Lama Island. And guess what their favourite book is? That one, The Tale of Oswald Ox. So I think a lot depends on what country you're in. Very good question. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. Do we have any other questions? Who's going to be brave? Aditya Roda. Aditya Roda is unmuted. You can ask question, Aditya, if you have any. All right, Dumbag, you take out the name of the next. Ananya Tiwari, you can ask your question, Dita. Hello. Unmuted. Hello. Hello. Yes, Ananya, you are audible. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, ma'am, I don't want to ask you a question. I just want to tell that I love to write English poems. Oh, that's uh, fantastic. On based on animals. Wow. Wow. That's fantastic. Very, very good indeed. Well, look, you know, the more you practice writing, the better you get. And if you look at... Um, I don't know if you've seen my blog yet, Sarah Brennan blog, 
But I've got a page on my blog where I talk about what authors did when they were children. And it's really interesting what you find out because I've found that all authors who are really famous today, and I've got a lot of them on my, it's, 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 I've got a page called Brilliant Books and one called Amazing Authors. All of these authors, when they were little, they read books a lot and they wrote diaries and things like that. Does anyone, do any of you keep a diary? Do you write a daily diary? My mind, my mind have a diary. You have already? Good. Excellent. Because keeping a diary is a very clever way of developing your writing skills because it's private. It's yours alone. And it means you can put all your feelings in it and no one else is going to read it. And when you write about your feelings and you're writing with passion because you're feeling something very strongly, that can really make for very interesting writing that's very original and very much your own. So that's a, that's a great way of doing it, keeping a diary. Well done. Thank you, Mum. I think Lavanya, does Lavanya have a question? So, Mum, I want to ask that even if your imagination is great, you need to get some topics. Uh, suppose I make a painting and I decide to do a still life painting and I see that topic from my window. So how do you get the topic to write your stories? That is an amazing question. And I love the simile you've got there when you're talking about painting a still life. What a fantastic question. Beautiful. Okay, how do you get ideas? You can get ideas from anywhere. I mean, I often say to kids, I do writing workshops, and I often say if you're stuck for an idea when you're writing a story, it's a fun way of getting an idea is to take an ordinary situation and give it a twist so I always say to kids put your hand out and here is your ordinary situation and then you go like this because <laughs> that's giving it a twist um, I'll give you an example it's a funny one that I use in my workshops okay so an ordinary situation might be that you are eating a bowl of cocoa pops I don't know if you've ever eaten cocoa pops but they're they're like rice bubbles rice krispies and they're covered in chocolate so you're eating a bowl of cocoa pops in the morning and it's raining outside it's a very ordinary day and you get right down to the last cocoa pop now that's your ordinary situation then you give it a twist so this is the twist. You say, suddenly the cocoa pop got bigger and bigger and bigger and rainbows started swirling around it and it became clear. You could see right through it and in the middle of the cocoa pop, I could see a bony hand and a finger beckoning to me and suddenly the cocoa pop exploded and it was an alien from the planet Zorg and he took me by the neck and he took me to his alien planet. Now, what you've done is you've taken an ordinary situation and you've said, what if? What if something interesting happened? So you could do another one. You could say, you know, it's a boring day on a Sunday or something and mum comes in with lunch. But there's a problem because as your mum comes through the door, she turns into a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Now, when you do a fun idea like that, what you're doing is immediately giving yourself an idea for a story. And it also gets your mind going. It's a good way to practice writing stories because immediately it's fun. It makes you excited. Excited writers write exciting things and they write in a great way. And it gives you a, a big problem that you have to solve. And as we all know, all good stories have to have a problem. So that's a little tip for you. If you're stuck for an idea, take an ordinary situation and then give it a twist. And it might be funny. It might be dangerous. It might be very exciting. But just start with that twist and then you'll be able to write or get ideas for a great story. Thank you, ma'am. My pleasure. Ritika, you can ask your dog queries. Ritika. Okay. Next, Sai Siti, you can ask your uh, question better. Ma'am, how many total books you have written? How many books? Yes. Have I written? Okay, well, um, I've written a lot of stories, but you don't 
get them all published. But the ones I've actually had published, the ones that you know I am an author of, we've got the Chinese calendar tales. Now, there are actually 12 animals in the Chinese zodiac, so that's 12 books. But then, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's also what we call a companion tale, which is this one, Dirty Stories. So this is 14 and 15, a dirty story and an even dirtier story. And then we've got a book that was published in Australia, um, and this was... Two years ago, I was very proud of this book. Here it is, Stormwell. You can see my name there. Because this one was actually shortlisted for the Prime Minister's Literary Prize in Australia. I was very excited. And I and my husband were flown down to Canberra and we met the Prime Minister. And I didn't win it, but I was shortlisted, which was a great thrill. So that one, that must be number 16. And then I've also written a, another book, which is for grown-ups, which is called Dummies for Mummies. <laughs> what you expect when you're least expecting. And so that makes 17. And now, big secret, I've written my first chapter book for children. And that one is currently being considered by a big publisher down in Australia. So I'm very excited about that. So that might be number 18. Good question. Uh, Danny Royal, ask your question. Okay, next Aditya, you can come in and ask for the Aditi, yes. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Mama, I like your story. Thank you. <laughs> Mom, which one what is the first book that you like and that become very famous? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the question. Can you say that again, darling? Mom, uh, what is your first book that you like and it become famous? The first book? Well, I mean, the first book was actually, um, well, I mean, A Dirty Story and An Even Dirty Story became very well known in Hong Kong, but not outside Hong Kong. So I guess it was um, Chester Choi. That was the first one that got very well known. And um, I was rather excited, actually, because it was chosen to represent Hong Kong in Italy. It's, it's in, a, in a library in Padua, would you believe, in Italy as a representative of Hong Kong or the representative of Hong Kong. So that one was the first one that got famous overseas. Okay, mom. I love to write diaries also. I write it daily. Excellent. Good. So do you write stories? Yes, mom, sometimes. That's wonderful. Look, something I wanted to tell you all about is if you want to practice your English and you want to practice your story writing, I run regular writing competitions for kids. And I have actually had entries from Delhi before from a school called the Delhi Public School. Mom, and every week in this school, there was one uh, story representation in which we uh, tell story to our teachers on some topic. Mom, I represented a very, very concentrated, with very wow. concentration. Well done. Fantastic. That's really, really good. Listen, I'd love you kids to, if you look at my blog, if you ask your teachers maybe to go on sarahbrennanblog.com, um, have a little look at the Clever Competition page because I run regular competitions. I'm about to announce the next one, which is going to be a poetry competition. I don't know if you like writing poetry, but it's a good way to practice. Um, but I alternate between poetry and story writing. And I take entries from all around the world. And I would absolutely love it if you kids would enter at my competitions and send them in. Your teachers will, will let you know how to do that. But um, that would be fantastic. And then I could keep in touch with you through your writing. That would be incredible. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. Adani, unmute yourself. Ask your question. Adani Roy. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Ma'am, I want to ask you a question. Do you do, uh, ma'am, uh, at what time you started writing books? 
That's a very good question. Um, well, remember when I told you about when I was little, I started actually writing when I was very, very young, but that was just for fun. I didn't get published until I came to Hong Kong, and that was in 2004 was my first book published here. So I was quite an old lady by then. I was in my 40s. <laughs> so I wanted to say to you kids, you can, you can have a dream and hold on to it, you know, and do it when you're older. Mama, I want to ask you one more question. That Where did you live when you were writing books? At the first uh, book you write in which country? Okay, right. Well, I was I lived in Australia. I mean, I was born in Tasmania, which is the island down the bottom. And that's where I started writing. Now, in terms of the books that have been published, A Dirty Story, I actually wrote that um, in Brisbane, where I was a university student. And the reason I wrote it was because I was doing a lot of babysitting. I was doing childminding. And one family had something like eight children. So I, I wrote that story for them. So that was in Brisbane. I've written, I write wherever I am. Um, a lot of my Chinese calendar tales, I've actually written the stories in France because that's where my husband comes from and every year we go there for holidays. And so I find if I'm sitting under a tree, it's, I need to sit under a tree, I need to be in nature to write my best and then I just write straight onto a pad with a pen. I just write onto paper and then I type that up on my computer. So, yeah, I, you can write anywhere, really. But I started writing when I was a little kid in Tasmania. Ma'am, ma'am, uh, ma'am, I was. I want to ask you one more question. That uh, how did you get this idea when you were so small? How did you do like this? That the, I can write books. I can do like this. How did you do all? All that you were doing also studies. <laughs> when I was so little, I, I think at the beginning, I didn't think I was necessarily going to write books. I just wanted to write. And as I said, I love Dr. Seuss's poems. And I just thought they were a lot of fun because what I realized when I read his books is that you can actually play with words, which I hadn't thought before. Before that, I thought words were very serious things, but he plays with words. And I am a very playful person and I just wanted to play with words and see if I could make them rhyme um, so that's why I started the writing um, and also I suppose because I've always loved reading books and when you love reading a lot you often feel oh I'd really love to write my own story so that's how it all started you can write Ma about the simplest of things Yes, Mom, who, Mom, who did the, who gave you, gave you the other books to read? Are you uh, only get uh, are you are your brother sister or also read with you? Well, I basically my mum and dad used to get us books, but in particular, we were the members of a library, and I remember we used to go to the library in our pajamas when we were little kids, and mum and dad would take us there in Hobart. And we'd go in at night. It was a special treat. And we would come home with armfuls of books. I think we were allowed to borrow about eight books each. So we were big, big readers when we were little. And we always loved going to the library. So that's where I got my books from. You don't have to have a lot of money if you have access to a library. And libraries often have the best collections of books and they can really broaden your reading taste because you can look at so many. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Good questions, darling. Anna, unmute yourself. Ask your question. <laughs> ma'am, I have about two questions. Can you okay. hear me? Yes, I can. From how many years have you been writing? How many years have I been writing? Oh, I think that's a rather tricky way of asking me how old I am. <laughs> no, I don't think you will be writing when you were one. No, I wasn't when I was one. I started when I was seven. Okay, so that's a lot. It's a lot of... <laughs> Are you saying I'm a very old lady? <laughs> no, I'm saying you've written a lot of books. 
<laughs> You're very sweet. No, 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 I've just written. I used to write poems and stories and I used to just put them in a plastic bag. And it wasn't until I came to Hong Kong with my plastic bag that I met a publisher who asked me if I had written for children and I pulled out my story, A Dirty Story, which I'd written in Brisbane many years before and um, showed that to him and that became my first book. So uh, always keep your early writing. Keep hold of it. You never know when it might be published. And I have another question. Which one yeah. of your books is your favourite? Aha. Do you know, I am always asked that question and I'm going to say what I always say. And that is, when you are the writer of a book, it's a bit like your baby and when the book is finished, it's a bit like giving birth. It's just so special and, and you just love that book. And I always, I love all of them um, for different reasons sometimes. I love Chester Choi because it was my very first Chinese calendar tale. I love Run Run Rat because my year of the Zodiac is the year of the rat. Um, I love my Sybil Snake book, which I know you've read, because that's my girl cow book. Um, so I, I do. I, I love them all for different reasons. It's hard. Um, I can tell you that one of the ones that I really love for the writing style is I love Oswald Ox, because the tale of Oswald Ox, it's a very, um, I call it a lyrical writing style. The, the words are very lyrical and they're very pretty and there's a lot of rhythm in the tale of Oswald Ox, which I think you'd probably enjoy, all of you, um, because I know that, um, you know, writing for you is often very lyrical and beautiful. I, I love, I have to say, receiving stories from India because Indian kids are a lot more lyrical in the way they express themselves than kids in other cultures. And so you use a lot of beautiful phrases and you lose, use a lot of beautiful adjectives and that. I absolutely love. I mean, you know, the Indian kids that enter my competitions tend to score very high because they write such lyrical language. So, yep, Oswald Ox is one of my favourites too, but I do love them all. Um, I, I tend to be most protective of my youngest book. So in, in this case, it's my tale of Ping Pong Pig. I'll show you that one. That one's all about a pig. There he is. That's my Ping Pong Pig. She's a girl, actually. And so that's the one I'm most protective of at the moment because that's my youngest book. Interesting question, but I can't really say which one's my super favourite. All right, Sarah, thank you so much. I mean, there are around uh, now 85 earlier there were 100 participants and uh, I think uh, most of them want to ask something else. Some are a little shy. They cannot ask you rightly, or, you know, they might be feeling That's a okay. little Look, I mean, you can always yeah. email me with your questions. Um, and yeah, we'll I'll be very the happy, email. you know, yeah. from the teacher sent me the questions. Yeah, we'll share email with Lovely. all of them. And sorry for the naughtiness of oh, our no. little ones. That's little kids. <laughs> That's little kids all over the world. Don't worry. <laughs> I probably would have done the same. I would have been a naughty girl. So please don't worry. <laughs> I mean, of course, uh, you know, they were enjoying uh, whatever we were discussing. And, you know, I love the fact that you have uh, gone through so many uh, different, you know, workplaces because uh, from there you get a lot of ideas. You do. And yeah. a creative person, yeah, a creative person like you actually needs a lot of ideas. And similarly, I mean, the participants here are very creative. And one message which I can think of giving them is just remain open-minded all the time. Because Absolutely. the person who's open-minded and who's a nature's lover will remain creative forever. Yeah, so I whether they're writing poetry okay. or they're writing stories, you know, they should, you know, remain open for all the opportunities which they are getting. So that is something really wonderful uh, out of this entire session which has come out. And uh, I'm sure because this, these kids are in an impressionable age right now. And I'm yes. very sure that they will pick this up from you today. And they will cherish this memory, you know, meeting you. And then I'm very sure that they'll remain connected with you. So right, we'll share, you email, and we'll share the other, uh, you know, potential of yours with them and uh, we'll ensure that they remain in touch because we want their creativity to continue flowing. 
So well, I'm so glad to remain connected. I, I think your school is absolutely wonderful. And one of my big passions is encouraging literacy in kids and, um, and, and having kids love love books and love writing and love words so anything that i can do i would certainly love to remain thank connected you so with very much. Thank, thank you so very much all the teachers must be i mean there are teachers also in the meeting room right now okay. and Sparch, you can email beta your question i can see your hand raised <laughs> <laughs> they're still keeping their hands raised yeah we'll email uh, give you the email of ma'am and then you can write to her and she'll write back to you okay i'd love to. that'd be wonderful thanks yeah. rashmi uh, thank hana uh, would you like to sum up uh, uh, dilbag if you can unmute her and kumud do you have something to add you can also add up yeah thank you so much ma'am uh, i wanted to thank sara sara it was so engrossing the story the illustrations the <laughs> weaving of the story children were absolutely glued leave apart children all of us teachers were glued to the screen and i must <laughs> mention here that your life story is so inspiring as ma'am <laughs> rightly said it is so so inspiring thank and you and yes very certainly rightly said that reading transports us to the world of imagination my take away from this session is correlation between reading fiction and empathy i yes. simply love that yes and uh, i believe all of our young readers they are going to read a lot and will grow up to be wonderful empathetic uh, uh, individuals <laughs> beauty for the nation thank you and thank you for the compliment as well as you said uh, indian children write uh, very lyrical yes of course yes. <laughs> oh, well. oh it's just so remarkable and it's it comes from your heritage and uh yeah. you know it's it's extraordinary and it makes me tingle um you know i i i would love to receive entries from your kids into the writing competition because i i think they would elevate the standard in me that would be exciting Fabulous. and i want to thank uh, rashmi ma'am and uh, dr kethpal also for giving us this opportunity for to our little ones to meet you and yes. ahana too because uh, she only interviewed uh, you i want to thank you everyone for coming and sarah i loved your presentation thank you uh -huh. um,